So Dan, uh, uh, great presentation. What do you think the 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 real weak link in the chain here is in this in this study, and also what the strength is? Well, good question. I think that it, it is slightly underpowered. I mean, to be transparent, we, we did aim for 65 events and we had just over 50. Um, so it, it could be a little bit more, uh, uh, it, it could be powered a little bit better. I do think that although we did include a fair number of intermediate risk patients at time of diagnosis, I do think that if we had a large group of intermediate risk and we asked the test to predict who would have adverse pathology after starting active surveillance for a few years. I think that might have a little bit more power for the biology to come out. And so did we dilute the power of the study a bit by having more low risk and some very low risk? Perhaps. I think the strength of the study is that this is a real world, multi-institutional, cohort of men on extra surveillance that really reflects who's going on extra surveillance. It also really reflects who the target for this test is. If you look at the NCCN guidelines, or if you look at perhaps who the insurance providers and Medicare is reimbursing for this test, it's these patients. It's not exclusively intermediate. It actually includes very low risk patients. And I think that we need to take uh, this study into the context of what's happening in the real world. So, so one, of one of the other, other things, things that uh, has, been has been discussed, discussed is the uh, and, and uh, yeah, the state yeah, entity yeah. actually, if you remember a long time ago, yeah. was, was discussed by Mitchell Benson, and um, it's sort of gotten uh, whisked to the side, but it's uh, coming back as a very good prognostic factor. and. How do you, how did you measure PSA density in the study? And uh, you know, there's I know you had log of the PSA density and things like that listed. So can you sure. uh, talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah, I agree. I mean, PSA density has had had a rich history. I remember one of my first papers ever was on transition zone PSA density. You probably remember that too. Oh right? yes, Michael Brower. And uh, when I was a resident, this is the mid '90s or early '90s. And um, I think that PSA density has had a storied past. I think for diagnostics, for the initial diagnosis of prostate cancer, I think there is some issues with that and questionable measuring measuring volume based on DRE versus truss. And so for the diagnostic setting, I think PSA density might have fallen out of favor for those reasons of measurement and confounding errors. For now, the setting of having had a, already had a diagnosis of prostate cancer, I think it's risen because first of all, we all have a trust biopsy uh, at the time of diagnosis, so it's much more accurate. I know that there's some issues with with uh, uh, ultrasound volume measurements, but MRIs on many patients, that's very accurate. And then we've realized the power of PSA density in the post-diagnostic setting in active surveillance. There's uh -huh. no doubt, and it's UCSF, Hopkins, the Canary cohort, the Toronto court have all reported on the power of PSA density. Having said that, when you ask about methodology for PSA density, certainly, our group has looked at using PSA alone and prostate volume, or do we combine them in a model? And as you know, you, you can't really have in all three in the same model because they're collinear. Mm -hmm. But I think that our group has actually found that by dividing and sort of disentangling P volume of prostate with PSA instead of combining them together, they actually work better apart. Having said that, uh, regardless of whether you have them apart or you put them together, PSA density in active surveillance clearly is predictive for upgrading. Now, now we've we've shown that it's predictive for for adverse pathology, and I think we'll be fine that it's even more predictive uh, as the models are built. So, yeah, you know, there's uh, the people are uh, groups are actually an institution sort of uh, bragging about the percentage of newly diagnosed patients that they place on active surveillance, and we've seen those numbers grow substantially from less than 10% to up to 40% or more in some situations. My feeling has been, and you've heard me say this, I don't think we want to find patients for active surveillance. We, want to, we, we don't want to find those patients. We want to find patients that need to be treated. Um, and to that end, um, 
you know, one of uh, that it, that's why the markers have come into some some uh, uh, utilization to determine who needs to be treated both uh, ones before you screen uh, actually do a biopsy uh, and after and that's what you're talking about the after ones but uh, uh, what are your thoughts about uh, things like MRI and uh, some of the tests that are done before biopsy uh, select in 4k and and things like that my sense is that they all add value in the pre-diagnostic setting in some way the the real thing that I always talk about is the NPV so is the negative predictive value if if there is a test that really will allow you not to do the biopsy and the sound bite that I have on MRI is I think MRI is great uh, but but it's the greatest in the post initial initial negative biopsy. If you look at the, the most advanced meta-analysis that just came out, or the Cochrane Review, which is 250 plus pages, the incremental value of an MRI without ever having had an, at, at the initial biopsy was something like 4% increased detection, something like that. And however, the incremental benefit after an initial negative biopsy was something like 44%. So it's much better after an initial negative biopsy. So I'm not sure it's yet ready for prime time as a screening for the initial biopsy. I do, however, think some of the blood-based and urine-based markers that are keying in on finding significant cancer and avoiding biopsies and not finding this active surveillance thing that we've just spoken about for the last 15 minutes is uh, are, are, are hopefully have even greater benefit. And ultimately, and again, you and I have talked about this before, when you combine the two, one can be a trigger for the other. I'm not arguing which one should be, but perhaps maybe a test that's preferably low cost, easy to access, uh, being a trigger for getting a, a maybe an MRI or a higher cost test and combine those to understand who to go forward with initial biopsy. I think that makes the most sense. Yes, it, it, it does. Um, any, uh... Any parting comments that you want to make? Um, we're, uh, and, you know, if, if you see someone that, that comes in with a, that got biopsied because their PSA was 4.1 yeah. and they have uh, a volume of about uh, 40 grams and um, the biopsy shows two cores of Gleason 6, uh, maybe a 347, but not sure. And, uh, two cores and 30 or 40 percent. Uh, what do you do with that person? Yeah. And let's assume they're 65 and in good health. Yeah. I mean, a three, four, there, I think so. First of all, I think that we, um, we in some ways have to figure out a way in the typical active surveillance patient, maybe not three, four and two cores of 30 to 40 percent, but maybe microfocal three, four, or maybe no three, four. Uh, those patients who do not need a biopsy for five years but still need to be on surveillance. And I think that we're working on models on that. Matt Cooperberg has a very interesting paper that I hope will be out pretty soon. You can interview him on who to have inactive surveillance on. Still surveillance, but inactive surveillance. And I think that we can find out a, a substantial proportion of patients that we can that get diagnosed for some reason. Maybe they should never have been diagnosed, but they get diagnosed. Mm -hmm. but we can put them on a more inactive surveillance. The patient that you present I think there are there are ways, and I didn't didn't ask you. You can let me know what you think. That there's three four, and then there's three four. I mean, I think that percentage of pattern four is an underutilized, under recognized, and underemphasized part of the three four phenomenon. Um, a three four that's forty percent pattern four versus a three four that I saw a, a man uh, this morning that had three percent pattern four. It was three four, but it was three percent pattern four. Those two patients are very different, and so we'd ask ourselves how to reconcile how much gleason pattern four there really was. In general, I think um, a conservative view would be to say that if you look at the randomized clinical trial data of Pivot or SPCG, the intermediate group did benefit from immediate treatment, and if you think 3-4 or real 3-4 is the intermediate risk group, then I would lean a little bit more in a healthy 65-year-old man towards recommending treatment unless there was this sweet spot biomarker that would really tell us the true story. Yeah, but you know, it sort of brings me back to 
one of the things we've spent the last decade doing, and that's interrogating the prostate with, um, with these mapping uh, biopsies, uh, which are systematically done at five millimeter intervals and so forth. And um, what, you know, we know that when the, the, the biopsies we're doing, the 12 cores are, uh, or more if you do that, but uh, you're only sampling, uh, you know, 0.5% of a prostate. And uh, we also know that that these cores get mixed up or people fall asleep at the switch and biopsy the same side twice. I've seen that. And we've all seen where patients have had uh, a nausea on one side and they get biopsied and they do a radical and, the, bi and the, the cancer on the biopsies are on the right side. You do the nodules on the left side and you do a radical and lo and behold, that's where the cancer is. I mean, we know something happened there that, that uh, it's, it's not perfect. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, you know I, and, and with, we've got a lot of data on thousands of patients now that 30% that of the time when you take these uh, patients that look like they're great candidates for active surveillance or active monitoring, whatever you want to call it, that we find uh, uh, badness. And that, that's about the failure rate too. So, uh, you know, I was I was uh, uh, hoping these markers would help us. I, I still think they do, but we've got a long ways to go. Uh, I don't know. What do you think about it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that when you we start getting better imaging, I think imaging is a key thing, and I think you've overcome some imaging issues with just uh, doing the doing the sampling doing better sampling, which is the sort of every five millimeter and so forth and saturations, which overcomes any imaging. Um, we've, we've seen the newer high frequency ultrasound looking at uh, uh, more precise imaging at time of biopsy or MRI as MRI will get better. I, I think it will get better. Um, and we'll be able to more confidently tell our patients that we've sampled their prostate adequately. I think it will like anything, it'll be a creep towards watching more and more of these pretty low risk intermediate group patients. But I, I do think it's gonna depend on imaging and then the ability to biopsy where it's showing us. Well, now that I have you cornered for a minute or two, let me just, it's great to ask you these questions, but yeah. what about, you know, are we gonna be doing radical prostatectomy in five years, I mean, it seems to me, if you don't need your prostate, there's so many different antigens. We're in, into an immunological therapeutic uh, time now, and we're starting to see that. Uh, do you see that happening in the future where you inject something into the prostate, um, an antibody or systemically, uh, checkpoint inhibitors, GMCSF, you know, the the uh, some of the other agents that we might be able, and then there's uh, wasn't there some studies going on with probins where we're going to be able to control prostate cancer that way? Yeah. I think that we probably won't be taking many prostates out for anything but the highest risk or the symptomatic bulky or something like that disease, probably like that, I, I think, because the wave of focal therapy is coming out for and again, as imaging gets better and being able to do repeat focal therapy, and, and I think that that will happen and, and it will be fine. And we'll figure out a way to do that as long as the trials get done. Right now, the focal therapy trials are mired in various regulatory and, and, and other bodies that unfortunately they won't do the big trials. It'll take years to figure out and it will just take great faith that those are working. The, the bulkier ones and the higher risk tumors, I think we probably still will do, although we've been working with some groups, as you know, this, this whole bispecific antibody or bite therapy that you don't even have to inject in the prostate. It can be intravenous because it'll be tagged to PSMA or something like that and deliver a co-stimulatory molecule or immunologic uh, stimulation uh, right directly as a really true targeted therapy, not, not a dirty targeted therapy, although of course, salivary glands and so forth have some PSMA, but we might figure out different different antigens. Five years, I'm not so sure, but maybe 10 for that. Uh, I could hope, I mean, uh, that, that we'd be kind of putting the, the intuitive da Vinci robot on the shelf, but it's gonna be a while probably. Right. 
Well, I think you know, the 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 targeted the, the therapies the fo that I call it focal therapy. I like to call it targeted focal therapy. I think the challenge with that is, is it's uh, it's uh, ready shoot aim because you don't know what your your target is and you're using MRI and you're using other ways and and you really if, if you don't know what you're going after then it's not going to work and I think that's one of the challenges and and that's why I believe in the mapping biopsies but you know imaging is probably the future to find out uh, a better way to to identify the lesion there's no there's no question, but I, I think that it is, it's going to be five years or less, but we'll see. Okay, hopeful, um, hopeful. And thanks for sharing your time with us. It's uh, been really valuable, and um, I know that the listeners are going to appreciate with uh, hearing uh, all the things you had to say. It's always great to talk with you, and uh, we wish you the best up there in Seattle. Likewise. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you. Mm-hmm.